It's Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, so you know what that means. It's time for another episode of Hashtag Event Icons, presented by Endless Events. The show where you get to ask the icons of the events industry anything. So, you might be wondering, how do you get to ask questions? All you have to do is use the question panel on the right of GoToWebinar to submit your questions. Or, you can hop on Twitter to submit your questions with the hashtag Event Icons. We'll be answering your questions live during the entire show. Before we get started, the more people we have watching, the better conversation we can have. So please help share hashtag event icons on Twitter and Facebook. Just tell your friends to watch at www.event-icons.com. Now, without any further delay, this is hashtag event icons with your hosts, Will Curran of Endless Events, Laura Lopez of Social Tables, and Brent Kruger of Event Technology Consulting. Oh yeah, welcome back everybody. Hashtag event icons, you know what it is. Uh, I don't want to waste too much time because we have an absolutely amazing topic today and a familiar face back to join us as well. We'll introduce in just a little bit, but uh, for those who don't know, uh, this is a viewer discretion advised episode. Uh, there will be no filters when it comes to language and potential offensive language potentially. Uh, this is the episode we entitle Shit Event Planners Say. So if that gives you any idea of what it's going to be about, um, definitely feel free to tune out. We will not be offended. However, if you want to hear the real deal story, the deep dive into the shit, as we called it, um, we're about to get into it. And to uh, introduce, our, uh, um, introduce our amazing guest, I am actually joined by my good friend, Brant Kruger, in the house, who is going to be uh, kicking off the show and introducing our amazing guest. I just love the fact that we're going to do a deep dive into the shit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that yes. that phraseology right there was worth the entire episode. I think just to go right into that. Uh, yeah, we are in fact being joined by Aaron Kaufman, who is the uh, president of Fifth Element Group. Uh, I think it's safe to say that Aaron is a rising international resource in a very competitive industry. Obviously, uh, how how well did I read that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, you, you did pretty good. All right. Now, the last time we spoke, Aaron, I think it was about 8 o'clock in the morning at an IMAX, and I, I imagine this one will be a little bit more lively because I think we were both <laughs> feeling it uh, a little bit that morning. Yeah, um, sure. it, was, it was calm. It was coffee. It was a very relaxed uh, conversation. Um, and then when I've heard some of the other interviews that you've done in the past, they've been a little bit more energetic and a little bit more um, uh, opinionated, shall we say. Listen, cuffs are off on this one, and, and we're ready to go. And, uh, yeah, let's, let's party. Yeah, well, for those of you that might recognize the name, Aaron has been on the show a couple times before, most recently episode 26, I believe, is the last one. Almost exactly. Has it been a, quite a year? No, it was earlier this year. Um, and uh, so if you want to go back and check out, it's episode 26, and you can hear more about what Aaron had to say on the first episode of What Shit, Shit Event Planners Say. Um, for those that might not have heard that one, uh, can you give us just the, the brief rundown of how you got into the events industry? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I started in the industry uh, too many years ago. Um, you know, David Adler, funny enough, told me the other day that I was too young to be an icon, but apparently not on this show so um, <laughs> I mean, that's we've cool. had like college students on this show before who are like doing crazy stuff so that that's messed up you're you're probably too old for this show i think i, I mean i i listen i'm turning 40 on monday which is fucking <laughs> insane to me um so, <laughs> so uh yeah you know i started in the industry um working in uh i worked in in clubs as a club mc so i was kind of like crazy dude jumping around on the bar pouring tequila and saying you know put your hands in the air show me your tits make some noise you know that type of thing uh, and then I went into uh, I went into some marketing um, all the while kind of learning about events how to set them up you know all that type of stuff uh, eventually about 15 years ago I started fifth element just because there was a need for someone to understand 360 degree design philosophy and how to produce design and manage an event in house um, rather than just saying they do and then having to call any number of people and since then it's been a wild ride so that's that that's the short of it <laughs> 
And then there's the, the, the usual standard second question. If you weren't in the events industry, what would you be doing instead? Um, I mean, I wouldn't be diving into shit, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, you never, never say never. I never mean, say never. You, no, you just I, don't know. Shit happens, right? But yeah. I think, I think uh, you know, I, I, I love the idea. I love marketing. and I love the idea of talking to people. And I really, I enjoy, I'm an old school sales philosophy guy, so I enjoy um, the face-to-face -face and stuff like that. So I think, you know, it could be any number of things, but it would probably be something really face to face and, and somewhere where I can be a little more aggressive than, than not. Awesome. Um, you know, I, I think, uh, <laughs> I think uh, we have some, the questions already started to flood in and I think it's distracting a little bit because they, these, everyone's ready for this episode. Um, and I think uh, everyone wants to know if you were to go back to your emceeing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, can you tell us a little bit about your tips that you had for doing such a great job at emceeing? I'm going to censor that question a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, you shouldn't censor it, but here's here's what I think. I think it's an MC. <laughs> um, listen, I have terrible ADHD, right? Like the kind that like people go on sick medications for. Um, and so to me, that was really my competitive advantage, right? I wasn't so slick and you know I wasn't kind of the guy that was like all right everybody how are we doing tonight like that wasn't my thing right so I jumped on bars and I used all the energy I had and um, you know I just said outrageous things which is no surprise to your audience um, and really I you know I knew how to how to uh, push people's buttons and make a party you know seem a lot crazier than maybe it actually was and of course the goal of an MC there's two of it one is to add to entertain right but the other in a club environment is to make sure that people feel like they had the wildest night of their lives because, of course, the next weekend, you want them to come back. Um, and so I think I, was, I think I was better at making people feel like they had a wild night than I actually was, um, you know, in the entertainment portion. That's awesome. I, I think I can definitely relate to that, though. I was the same way. Like, I used my energy to my advantage. And I, I think it shows, though, too, because, I mean, like, your personality is so lively. And I think people, like, really get attracted to that personality of that, like, excitement and the energy that you have. Um, sure. And I think that's why you obviously are seeing a tremendous amount of growth, for sure. Um, so to bring it back on the topic, uh, yeah. let's kind of open it up and go into some shit event planners say. Um, yeah. So let's start off with the generic question that, um, you know, might have been covered a little bit in the last episode. but. Sure. Sure. What, are, what do you think are some things that you common things that you hear event planners say uh, to at events, uh, even to clients potentially as well? What are some things you hear, and we can kind of comment and discuss each one. So why don't you start sure. kick it off with one of the most common things that you hear event planners say? Yeah. So here's here's there's one that's driving me fucking berserk lately, um, and it's this whole uh, uh, we have the most stressful job. We're the third most stressful job in the United States of America according to the New York Post or whatever else, right? Um, and I probably touched on this last time because it was probably driving me crazy last time too. Um, this, this, like, everyone needs to stop with this nonsense. Um, and I hear people say it to clients, like, you know, we have a big team we put together and it's because, you know, we have the most stressful job according to New York Times and Post. Forbes. And Forbes. I mean, they're all doing it. They're all doing it. And they show like the stupid pictures. It's a stress on score of fifty-one point one five. Just in case you were curious, it's... that's a real thing. Yeah. Good. Well, anyways, it's, it's like, it's, 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 it's like it's they stressed out. <laughs> they stress. Did they like give each person a job and they're like, see how stressed out they could get them? And like that person's like blood pressure rose like fifty-one point one extra points or something like right. that. Right. <laughs> Um, or, you know, I, all, I often hear planners now, uh, now also saying, you know, we, we, we have a proprietary formula to make sure that your event will be successful. No, you don't. You have the binder that you got 10 years ago in college that tells you how to write a schedule. You're not doing you, – the, the proprietary part is the creative, right? And so unless a planner is claiming their own creative or actually doing their own creative, there's nothing proprietary. When, when my team works – I don't. I definitely never tell clients it's proprietary, but we do our design internally, right? So I don't sub that out to a third party. And for me, that's somewhat proprietary because we have a style to it. So I sell that to my clients, right? But I don't talk about it all. I'm so stressed in our proprietary system of this. Come on. Like what we do is um, 
as a as an industry and as planners, producers, managers, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, some people are live architects, or whatever the fuck it is. What we do or what our play is is that we can um, touch people and affect people's lives on a daily basis through positive experiences, right? And that is neither stressful nor proprietary. That just is. So every day that we work and every time we set up a production or every time Endless walks into a building, every time Brandt does something, I do something, we're able to put smiles on people's faces because that's our job, right? We're able to educate people. We're able to affect their emotions. And that to me is what we do, right? We don't, all this other bullshit, you know, I'm so stressed and whatever else, but people never tell their clients that. People never tell them, my job is to make sure that we are going to provide you with a live experience that is going to affect your guests. Awesome. Right? And I think that that's a really big miss for our industry. Uh, so I have a kind of a follow-up to that. Um, yep. You mentioned, like, obviously people creating this myth of stress and this idea of proprietariness and this competitive advantage thing. Do you think that the reason why that comes from that is that we're such a like a, a low barrier to entry industry and so people are trying to create new barriers to like fake barriers to entry to make it seem like our jobs are harder than they really are or create more value by what we do? Like what are your kind of thoughts on that? Yeah. So first of all, I'm going to correct you. We're not a low barrier to entry industry. We're a no barrier to entry industry. Um, so, so we have that. Uh, yeah, you know what? I, I think it's just people reading other people's stuff, right? So here's the thing. I've been speaking all over uh, all the world at this point about, uh, I've been doing a session called an industry intervention. And I get to speak to people who are veterans of the industry and people who are brand new. And my position is very clear on a number of things. We talk about transparency. We talk about pricing. We talk about this whole stressful BS. We talk about leadership in the industry. But one of the things that I really touch on is the idea that there is no barrier to entry. And you'll find that the older generation at that point in my in my presentation starts to nod their head. And the younger people are like, you know, I, I talk about the fact that um, people, the, the, one of the most common phrases you hear in our industry is, I'm going to go out on my own. Right? So you don't see an ad executive on a Friday go, I'm going to go out on my own, and by Monday he's got his own company. Right? That doesn't happen. Or you don't, you, know, you don't see that in other industries. But for some reason in ours, you can do it. And so what I've been telling people all over the place, right? and I'm going to tell your viewers the same thing, and they may see me speak again, and they'll hear the same message. The only way for us to do this is to create some barriers to entry. And the smartest way to do it is to... Uh, educate clients on what a minimum requirement should be to hire a company. And the first minimum requirement that I recommend is a $5 million per occurrence liability insurance policy. Why? Because number one, it should be there. Number two, any big, any company who actually goes to an insurance broker or, you know, an insurance company and says, here's what I do. I need insurance. That policy is not $500 or a thousand dollars for a year. And now all of a sudden what you're creating is an industry that requires capital, right? And so all of a sudden, all of these people now, they could leave their job on a Friday and open a company on a Monday, but they will have to invest ten dollars or $20,000 into doing it. And I guarantee you that stops the fragmentation of our industry and it keeps people with amazing skills in companies, right? So that companies can grow. We need bigger companies in our industry. We don't need more mom and pops, right? We got to be able to fight off competition and whatever else. And so we can't do that if there's no barrier to entry. And so that's for me, one of the things that I've been talking a lot about lately, the fact that we need to create a system whereby companies or people need to have capital in order to ultimately open their own companies and get hired. Right. Mm. And, and so that's, that's the barrier to entry. Portion of my I love conversation. it. Yeah. <laughs> Preach. <laughs> yeah. The only I'll, thing that yeah. I struggle with that is, is as someone who did leave a con company and went out on their sure, own with with z you know zero zero money down. Yep. Um, you know, uh, that would have created a barrier. Yeah, it's a little obviously I'm not a planner, but that would have created sure. a barrier for me. Um, and. I, so I struggle a little bit with that just on a personal level, but I get sure. the idea. I like the concept of it. Yeah. And look, you know, that may not be the final answer, 
right? That may not right. be the way that it has to go. And, you know, in your position, you may, there may be different requirements, right? And a marketing company, if someone tried to leave and open their own marketing company, liability insurance wouldn't be the first thing that I think of. But in our industry, you know, it, it's, there's a couple of things. Number one, we tend to be notoriously underinsured to begin with. And so when something happens, everyone goes, oh no, what are we going to do? You know, or I need a copy of, you need to co-name me on your insurance so I can work because the venue requires 2 million. I only have 1 million and all this kind of, you know, nonsense that goes on. So my, I guess the point of what I'm saying is if you create a system that absolutely requires the purchase of something very expensive and insurance being, you know, a thing that I think we already undervalue in our industry, um, I look at it and say, it's just requiring a state where people will require capital. Right, so you can't just go out and call your, you know, two clients that, you know, your company had before, and try and go and work for them, and you know, make some money and whatever else. That's not an option anymore because now you have to invest in yourself. And our industry doesn't require an investment in self in order to start a business. So whatever that that would be, whatever on your side, Brent, that would be, that would cause that. And I'm certain that you would be. Um, at a skill set that you might say, okay, I'm leaving my job. I have to invest five grand in my business, but I'm confident I'm going to be there. What I find though is that it's the people who will go, I just don't want to work for anyone else. I'm going to do my own thing. And they call yeah. a couple of their previous clients and they jump out on their own and then they fuck it up for everybody because they do a terrible job. They don't know how to run a business. They lower the prices, right? Because now they're all of a sudden going, shit, I need to make money. How am I going to pay my rent? So they do a job that they maybe would have done for the company at ten thousand dollars for five thousand dollars, because personally they can make two thousand dollars. I don't think you know, we've all seen that as well. Yeah, where where that, that exact scenario plays right. out. But with capital, you can't do that. If you require capital yeah. over your business, you can't do that. I think um, really quickly too. I think we talked about a lot about this last time uh, too about the the titles that people call uh, planners. That uh, obviously you you think this idea that like, people call like, a designer is different than a planner, than a manager, than a producer, all these things like that, whatever. Sure. Um, but um, Nick does. Nick Borelli is in the audience right now. Brings up a good yeah. point that. There's also a difference between consulting and planning. If you're planning and taking responsibility for the whole event and hiring all the subcontractors, everything like that, taking a cut of every single one of their things, that's probably where you need to have that massive you know, budget. But if you're just coming in there and saying, hey, you should pick this vendor, you should work with this, here's some advice, then you don't really have the liability because you're not necessarily – I mean while you are directing them towards vendors, those vendors should cover themselves. So I think that's uh, an important distinction that Nick has made as well. Uh, it's just so for those people who are like, whoa, 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 well, I mean, like, I'm not really in charge of the event. So, uh, and I'm sure if you refer back to episode 26 uh, to the difference in titles and why we think it's a little crazy right now, but um, good, a very, very good point. Um, Brent, um, I know you had uh, a couple of questions and thoughts and all that jazz. We're, like, the well, chat is just flooding it right now. Yeah, it is. It's, it's mostly Nick, who we love. Uh, <laughs> but it's, um, I wanted to just round out, you know, I, it occurred to me while you were talking before just about the lists and things like that, that I think one of the, honestly, if we all dug down deep, the reason that stuff gets circulated is because it's kind of cool to be on the same list as firefighters and police. And I think it's really probably not anything more than that. Like, oh, I'm on the same list as people that are like, you know, really, really have really dangerous jobs and things like yeah, that we you know, know we're not even close to. Um, we are like talking about surgeons and stuff like that. We're listed ahead of that. Like any somewhat educated, smart person has to look at that list and go, I don't even want to be associated with that. Like how are we listed ahead of ambulance people? <laughs> right. Right? I say people because whether they're drivers or the back, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how, how is that possible? Like I go out and plan a party or an event, and they go and scrape someone off the ground, and right. my job is more stressful than that. I mean, I don't. Uh, I'm, I'm not buying it. So. Moving on to some of the other things that I've been floating around as far as shit planners say. Um, yep. So this is the deep dive into the shit. Is what yeah, we're saying. really deep diving yeah. into we're shit. We're in the shit already. Swimming yeah. around in it. Um, why is it, you know, you talked about kind of lowballing on the pricing, and it, it, it makes me wonder, you know, when you go down that road even further, you know, why is it that there are planners that will say yes to plan an event for free 
I mean, we could equally have a similar discussion, uh, you know, surrounding speakers, and I know that's been a hot topic for you as well. But, um, you know, specifically planners going for that free event. So, okay, so the, 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 the thing I hear most is, can you work for exposure, work for exposure, work for exposure? Right. There is always an opportunity to work for exposure. However, that needs to be real exposure, right? So if you're working for exposure, you're talking about major opportunities to make money. Um, you know, one of my one of my favorite examples is, um, you know, we'll get a hotel chain that will call us and say, we're going to bring in 150 planners and do this and that and whatever else. We're going to have a kind of a fam type of thing in our hotel. We're going to plaster your name everywhere. We're going to give you an opportunity to speak. We're going to do this and that. That's a marketing opportunity. That's not working for free. Okay. That's a marketing opportunity where then I get to decide if I actually want to do it. Right. I'm not take, I'm not getting a call from a client going, you have to work for free. And I'm going, okay. Um, and I think so that I think first of all, there's a difference between deciphering a marketing opportunity whereby I may make an investment of five grand to make an event, but I'm looking at a possible return of a hundred grand. I mean, that makes sense. The problem is that people think that they are going to be attached to an event. They're going to do it for free and then they're going to promote it and people are going to jump on board and go, wow, you did that. Cool. And that never happens. That never, ever, ever happens. Um, and so I think that that's, you know, that's really the difference. And again, I think, and it, I, I will go back again to what we were just talking about, about barrier to entry, because I think that you have people who aren't uh, or shouldn't be running their own businesses, but they think, you know, I can do this because I was working for someone else. And, and they think that it's a wise business. I mean, what they don't think about is that it's just lowering the bar for everybody. We did have a question come in since you routed back to that and we'd kind of blown by it, but we did have a question come in that asked on the subject of barrier to entry, yep. what about the new degrees and programs that are being created uh, yeah. in a lot of the colleges and universities? Does that count as some kind of, you know, minimum level of uh, qualification in your mind? Like I'm afraid this is going to turn into a GIF and a tweet, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um the answer is the basic By the way, for those who are watching the video podcast, the video version of this is so much better than the audio one. <laughs> um, the, the basic answer to that is that the designations generally are don't don't hold a lot of value. So until someone steps up and says, "This is the, now I'm a CSEP." And I, it's an ILEA designation, and when I go in to do a pitch, I always have a page about CSEP and what it means and whatever else, right? Then the person who follows me comes in with a CMP, and then the person who follows me comes in with something else, and you know, something else, something else. There needs to be a regulatory body that says, fuck it, this is what we're going for. This is the system whereby you are going to be accredited in the industry and what makes sense. So. Uh, no, the, the, the honest answer is young industry professionals, my advice to them is don't bother with the designations, go and work for somebody. And in fact, I had a conversation in Calgary at Ivy Alive with a young industry professional who was looking to move up in the world. She was, you know, what should I do? What should I do? And considering moving. And I put her in touch with, and I'm, I won't say who, but I put her in touch with a real industry icon, someone who I consider to be a super woman in our industry um, and one of the greatest there is. And I said, if you want to go, get an education and you want to better yourself, be humble, listen, be smart, be strategic, and go work for someone who can teach you everything that you'll never learn from anywhere else. Um, and so I think that the designations are nice. It's, some, it's a marketing thing, right? It, it's definitely, you know, you can market yourself that way. It's nice to be part of a club, right? I'm part of the CSCP club. I like that. But uh, yeah, I think that all the education, new degrees, blah, 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 just go to work, work hard, get an education if you want to, but don't rely on that. Go work for somebody who can teach you and who can mentor you and who you can become part of their organization, help them grow and then become someone else's boss, right? Not on your own, but under the guidance of other people and become someone's boss and then, you know, Become that person's boss who's someone else's boss and teach. That's the way progression in industry goes, right? Except for ours. 
Awesome. Um, I think uh, th this uh, this definitely this topic of education like obviously spreads. It's like a meta discussion as part of education as a whole with you know colleges and things like that and you know people saying hey is it really worth it for me to go to college versus getting experience so I don't want to dive like too much into that because I think that's sure. a larger education discussion as a whole um, but I think you hit it right on the head that yeah sometimes uh, you know experience is better than education. Um, and definitely you get what you put out of it and either way right like if you just go to school and read the books and take the tests and sure you get A's you can come out being less ready than the person who said, went there got C's and you know made connections with all of their professors that end up getting them their you know their first big event or whatever it may be sure. so you know it's funny um, because I, I interview a lot of interns right I get like 60 or 70 intern requests a year and I get them from all the colleges in the area and whatever else and for me, it's really interesting because when I sit down with them, they are not, they don't know, they can't jump in and work for me. They can't jump in and even help me. They can jump in and learn. But when I ask them some of the questions that I think I might have known a year or two into, into working in the industry, they have no idea. Right. And I think that to me clearly demonstrates that the education is great. Don't get me wrong, but it's not the be all and end all of getting into the industry. Getting into the industry means networking, learning, growing, talking to people, all that type of stuff. I love it. Um, so I had this question that I, I, I wanted to ask you because uh, as a vendor, uh, yeah. I get this one all the time as well yeah. and it's always very interesting and I'm sure planners get it as well and I hear planners say it all the time and we're also getting this from, from the audience as well so uh, Will's not just dominating the conversation here. Sure. <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> but um, my question is, uh, you know, people all the time, event planners complain about budget. It's like the number one thing that people complain about most. No one ever complains about, um, you know, the client's creativity not being great or um, they're I, to be honest I don't hear it as much as like t even time people don't complain about how not having enough time either but everyone seems to always complain about man if we had more budget if um, you can get this lower in budget it seems like this is like the hot topic everyone complains and talks about the most um, you know is there a better way to have budget discussions from an event playing perspective that than what we're having today than the oh hey send me your blind bid or oh here's my budget that I made up let try to fit in that that hole. What are your kind of your thoughts? So okay, so the first thing is that I think the industry is so worried about being so nice that they forget that it's a business, right? And so when a client calls me and says, "Hey, you know, we're looking for this," and sometimes they'll send me, "We want this, 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 and this." My first reaction is, right away, I won't do any work. I will tell them, "You you you can't afford this." Right? I'm really sorry. So. You have two options. Either I can give you this, and here's what I think it's going to cost, give or take, or I can put together an event for you that you're going to be happy with within your budget. Right? That's the first conversation. But people get so excited by the idea that someone's coming to their, you know, knocking on their door with an event opportunity that they go, oh, we've got to just, you know, got to keep them happy and got to do this. But the, <laughs> and yes, you want to keep them happy, but I think clients also appreciate honesty. Right? And I can't tell you how many times I have ended up with clients because they tell me, you know, uh, the previous company I work with always over-promised and under-delivered. And, and to me, that's a sure fire way to lose business. I mean, um, you know, when we go in and, and we work, um, you know, what we, what we promise is what we deliver because that's business 101. That's what you do. Um, and I think that, you know, I, I think that one of the, the budget complaints is really just people not being able to say, hey, you can't afford that. Look, if I, if I look at a bid and they say, you know, we want all this stuff, right, and it's for a huge event, right, and ASAE was just here, and there were a number of bids going around, and I looked at it, and everyone would call me and say, hey, are you in on the ASAE bids? And most of them was like, you know, I not, it, it may not be for me. I say, oh, we prepared something, but the budgets were so tight, and we can barely make any money. And you know, I don't, I, I'm not so. Sure, we didn't get to be creative in this and that. And I'm thinking, man, so what the fuck are you doing it? Yeah. Why are you doing it? Exposure. If, right, exposure. <laughs> if nobody responded to those bids because there wasn't enough money to do it, then whatever. And if one person responded to it because they have everything they need in, a, in their warehouse, you know, a huge decor coming to something else. 
cool. Then that is tailor made for them because they already have it. They can make money on it, right? So everyone should just back the fuck away and go, it's not for me. And I think that that's one of the really interesting things because people see RFPs and they go, oh, RFP, the RFP process, grrr, right? And I go, look, request for a proposal doesn't mean I need this in my office in seven days. It means here's a request. Would you like to do this? Is this for you? That's it. If an RFP has no budget to it, don't respond. Amen. Right? It's, it's, it's this type of thing. So the budget conversation shouldn't be one. If a client comes to me and they have, you know, arbitrarily, you know, $10 to do an event, if, I, if I'm not busy in that couple weeks and I can make a little bit, sure. But it doesn't mean I'm going to lower my prices. I mean, I'm going to say, okay, I'll do this event for you because I can do it for this much money. If I don't want to do an event, guess what? I don't do it. Been, right. as we've been sitting here talking, I've been trying to dig up a video that I saw a while back that was, it's, and I j literally just found it. So it's called the vendor client relationship in real world. Right. And uh, it is quite we'll worth the watch. Yeah, quite yeah. worth the watch. And uh, the what you were talking about there just is the couple sitting at the restaurant and the bill comes and the guy says, yeah, I'm sorry, we didn't budget for this. You know, right. it's, it's right. just basically applying all of these business things that and, and putting them into the real world situations. Right. And those are always quite funny. Absolutely. So, yeah, we'll, put, we'll drop that in the, in the show notes. Definitely worth a watch. Um, see him with really the, quick, uh, Brett, have a comment. Yeah, Real yeah. quick, I, I was just gonna say I think the one thing that um, oh my gosh I'm losing it because I love that video so much I started <laughs> just like imagining the entire video. Um, the one interesting thing that you kind of uh, talked about with the, the the budgeting aspect. Oh my gosh, it's fleeting me now. Brand, take over. I'm totally forgetting my question okay. right now. I'm well, I mean, what what struck me what struck me in, in my head is is the is the honesty factor. That just being honest with vendors and and not trying to play this game of well, I'm gonna I'm gonna have 20, but I'm gonna say it's 15 right. because I know that they're gonna wind up overcharging me later. So I'm gonna keep that five in reserve because they're gonna wind up over. If you're worried that your vendors are going to be taking advantage of you you're using right. the wrong vendors I agree. you know yeah. if you're if you're that worried about it you know you don't go to the mechanic saying you know well i think it's going to be 2 grand but i'm going to budget 25 because the mechanic's probably going to screw me i mean right People have a, a lot of the same fears you know, when it comes to AV companies because they just don't know the language, which is why I try and do a lot of education. Will, I know you do too on you know, trying to be more transparent about the industry. But that, that vendor relationship of just, you know, it's, it's, it's really not rocket science. Just, just be honest. And, you know, I think it comes down, you, you made an excellent point about just knowledge in general, right? So how can you plan an event if you don't understand lighting? decor, production, everything. How can you plan? Whether you want to call yourself a manager, a producer, a planner, whatever the, you know, you want to call yourself. At the end of the day, how can you plan? How can, how can a client come to you? And this is a, this is a client not being educated too, but how can a client come to you and not ask you, what's your knowledge in lighting? Lighting in AB is a huge portion of, of what we do. And I have good knowledge of lighting in AV. It's not, I'm not a, a solid lighting and AV guy. I have, um, you know, a, a person I work with who is more knowledgeable than me, but I can tell you exactly what I want, what I want it to look like. And he may say, you know what, I would change this, this, and this, and we have this new this or whatever, right? Same with flowers. I know my flowers and my floral. I know, you know, all that type of stuff. How can you plan an event not doing it? And so I think education is a thing. And I'll tell you real quick, um, it, it kind of as an offshoot, but my, my wife went to one of these quick oil change places uh, a few weeks ago. And when she was going, I said to her, you know what? Be very careful, right? Because they're, they're notorious for this, right? They get under your car, they go this, and they go, oh, you know, you need this, 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 and this, and your $50 oil change turns into a $500 worth of filters. And so they, they basically, you know, they... And, and she obviously, you know, being female, they look at her as if she won't know anything. So I kind of said to her, you know, and she's smart to begin with, but I said to her, just don't, don't do anything else. Um, and the guy said, oh, you need a, a, a new air filter. And she was like, oh, I don't think I need a new air filter. I just had a change last time at my regular mechanic. The guy said, okay. And then he went underneath the car and it's kind of behind the glove box somewhere. I don't know, but and it's irrelevant. But he said, oh, you know what? There's a filter back here that I think needs changing too. And she was like, 
I'm not doing that either. And the guy gave her a quote for $300 and she looked at it and said, I just want the $50 oil change. Right? And I think it's so important to understand because people in our industry see opportunities to make money and mark up shit that they're, that's invisible to the client. And the client has no idea what they're doing, and, but neither does the planner. So I agree with Brent what you're saying. They're holding back money and they're going to rip me off. I also think that educating our industry and then educating our clients will help streamline things a lot better. So, Will, did we stall awesome. long enough? You, did you remember what it was you Will, wanted to start? Will totally remembers what he was <laughs> thinking about. Uh, Aaron has a great job at jogging Will's memory. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think to really circle back a little bit more at the beginning, uh, to kind of summarize something that you said, is that uh, a lot of times people have to be ready to say no. We're such like a, a hospitality yes industry. Yes, what can I do to help you? And even like at Endless, too, we want to say yes to everything. But eventually, we learn just like sometimes the best service you can give someone is no. And like you said, with the bids, sometimes like if everyone who can't actually do this said no, it actually might make the event better because I've seen it where I've declined bids and then everyone else declined the bid. And then the client came back and said, we realize we can't do this in this budget. Yeah. Here's another one. You're like, oh my gosh, where'd this money come from? We can make this happen now. Great. We can give you great service. And the event ended up being great. Um, but one of my favorite examples was I just had actually uh, 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 another AV company reached out to us and said, hey, we need some gear, some labor. Can you take care of this and this? And I said, yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, can you just show me what you're getting from the other company you're bidding against? We don't like blind bids at Endless at all um, because we find that it just ends up turning into a fight for the cheapest and that you don't end up getting what you actually need it and things get forgotten and it's just not fun. So I said, hey, send me over to the other company what they put together. I'll tell you if I can do it or not. I'm going to save you a ton of time by getting you saying yes or no really fast. But then he, I, he ended up saying like, no, I can't send it over to you. I said, well, we're going to decline then at this time. You know, we're not – we're not in that business to go lowest and cheapest and just give it to you. We want to give you great service and make sure that we're giving you something equal to what that other company's giving. And he's like, I've never seen someone do that before. And he was like, offended. <laughs> and I was like, look, you're going to get way better experience if I give you exactly what you need. And uh, I think more companies need to be willing to do that, to say like, no, this isn't going to work out. Right. Absolutely. Uh, but again, you know, you have people who are working in their basements and mom and pop shops and whatever else. And, you know, making two grand when you should be making 10 grand is better than making nothing. Uh, but that's a philosophy that's going to fuck all of us. So I think, you know, as an industry, we've got to stop it. Love it. Why do you think in general uh, sometimes there's this hesitation to be honest with each other, whether it's between the client-vendor relationship or even – Planner to planner, like sometimes you see people holding stuff really close to the vest that are in similar industries that could, you know, learn so much from each other. You know, there's not really going to be, you know, how you guys do your internal meetings isn't going to affect your quarterly results that much. Uh, you know, you guys could probably talk to each other just because you're in two different banks or whatever, those kind of things. Sure. Yeah. Uh, do, do you see that as well? I mean, I, that's something that I've felt just kind of on the periphery of, of being like vendor guy. Like, you, why aren't you guys talking to each other more? Yeah, you know what, I think that, so I think the first thing is that what, what you end up with is, um, you end up with a, a pretty, there is a 5 or 10% of the industry who are savvy, well-organized, smart business people, and then you end up with a bunch of shitty business owners, and so um, I think what, what happens oftentimes is, and I, I would say it happens to me, uh, as well as a number of people I know where, you know, they want to, there's a lot of brain picking that goes on. Let me pick your brain a little, right? Let me ask a lot of questions, right? And I'm happy to share information, right? I'm an open book. You want to ask me something, I'm going to answer it. And if I really don't want to answer it, I'm going to be honest and say, you know what, that's more than what I, I'm happy to give out. Um, but I think it's the 90% of the industry that's so worried because they're not confident in their work. They know they're working for probably less than they should be, um, and you know they know that if I if I all of a sudden called their client and said, "Hey, you know I can give you this, 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 and this," they're going to lose it, and so they need that two thousand dollar job here and there to stay afloat. Um, you know, one of the funny things for me is, and, and I pro maybe I mentioned this last time even, but one of the things I laugh about is that um, people are so slow to share, right? And they're so concerned, you know, oh this client, this client, whatever else. But yet, you put you open someone's website and it says, um, you know, in quotes, 
you know, XYZ company did an amazing job at transforming the room and living up to my vision. I wouldn't hesitate to recommend them. Jane Doe from the Hospital Foundation. So I go, oh, that's pretty neat. And then I call up Hospital Foundation. I go, hi, is Jane Doe available, please? <laughs> Hi, Jane. I, you know, I own an event company. I saw some, a recent article about your event. It looked lovely. I'm just wondering for next year if you'd be willing to include me in your RFP list. And Jane says, oh, sure, why not? You know, we're pretty happy with our company. And I say, look, you know what? Send me the specs of what you're looking for. If I can be an option 1A and give you something competitive to look at, that would be wonderful. And then, you know, that's why people are afraid to share. But I'll be honest with you. When any, if you're in, so I'll reference ad companies a lot and, and I'd love to get into why in, in a minute, but um, when we have a second, but um, listen, in an ad company, when the business goes up for bid, right, there is no mercy. Ad companies fight tooth and nail and they'll fly executives and they'll do presentations and they do, you know, that whole RFP thing or whatever, that's serious when you get into ad and marketing companies, right? Because they're agency of record at that point. Um, and they're really fierce about that business. And believe me that people switch from ad company to ad company to ad company. And so the person who may have, you know, repped the ad company last time Coca-Cola signed, maybe with a different company now and Coca-Cola's up for tender. And so guess what? A new company is going to win that business because Coke likes the guy who switched company. So, um, you know, but in our industry, again, it's so like, uh, kumbaya and like whatever else. And so I, I think what you end up with is people really worried that the real business people are going to make it hard for everybody to earn a living. Um, and that's really the reason why they're afraid to share. They're not confident in their work and they're not confident they can hold their clients. Epic. <laughs> pretty sure there's a video about spec work too. That's that's I'm pretty sure good there is. <laughs> for, for the sure advertising there is. advertising world. But if, <laughs> if real life if real life worked as spec work, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> so, so you mentioned like the idea of companies moving back and forth, and we have an amazing Twitter question. I don't know how they quote they fit all this word into. Alex translated it, I think this a little sure. bit into an actual uh, question, but I uh, mentioned that basically, you know, like the industry is very like musical chairs. People are leaving from one company to the other, and people are constantly looking to level up, go to another job, and things like that. Yeah. And you know, can you mention like this idea that people are afraid also to lose their jobs potentially? Like I hear a lot of planners that are like. I'm afraid to give more, uh, you know, delegate some stuff, for example, especially on the AV side, right? AV is so complicated, and if a planner can really hone that in and have that process, oh, they're indispensable. But the second a company comes in and says, I'm going to make your life easier and actually make it so you're not having to do any of the AV work, all of a sudden they go, well, you're, gonna, you're taking my job. I've heard that a million times, or I'm worried that, you know, that makes me look more, indisp more dispensable. You know, like how do people combat this, or should people even be worried about this sort of stuff? I mean, listen, if you're worried about your, your job and someone else can do it better than you can, guess what? And their own fucking job. So <laughs> the thing about it is that, like, you know, if, if, if our industry – and here's what I'm going to reference the ad, ad industry. So if our industry doesn't get their shit together and figure out how to have companies, here's exactly what's going to happen. And I'll do my third episode of Shit Event Planners Say in a year from now. And you're going to see this more because you're starting to see it in – so the rental companies just went through a big thing where um, they all started buying each other and mergers and acquisitions. And you have venture capitalist companies who are – you know, Berkshire Hathaway is one of them, bought a bunch of stuff. There is a lot of money in what we do. And our industry is very healthy and very flush. So I'm going to tell you exactly what's going to happen very soon. There are going to be there is going to be an industry, a very strong industry, the ad industry, marketing, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of PR. And these these industries have gone through all the growing pains already, right? There are industries that are now you know 50, 60, 70 years old. Um, you know, ads have been around a little bit longer, but real good solid companies have been around kind of since TV, radio, etc. Um, and what you're going to find now is that those companies are really going to turn to their clients and go, you know what? You're, you're already, you know, we're an agency of record for you for print, for web, and for, you know, whatever else. Uh, why don't we add online to that? Or sorry, why don't we add uh, in-person, live experience? And the uh, company's going to go, well, that makes sense, I guess. So now what's going to happen is the ad agency is going to turn to someone like me and go, hey, we're going to buy you out. 
right? Because the ad agency understands how to put three executives in a room, charge $200 an hour, right? Charge for creative, charge for time, charge for the work, charge for everything else. Because ad agencies know how to do that and they have clients on retainer, right? They're the agency of record. And so as long as you're doing a good job, clients thrilled and budgets become less of an issue. Requests for proposals start to go away because who are you requesting for a proposal? Your agency of record, right? So all of a sudden, if I became the vice president of live experience for an ad firm because they bought me out, and I started helping all of their companies create their live events, their holiday events, whatever else, their activations. Guess what? None of those companies need event companies anymore. So suppliers will be okay for, for, for the foreseeable future, but planners and managers won't because ad companies can make so much more money than we can. So this is where this is, <laughs> is going to turn, right? It's this definitely is, already starting like to it. happen. Yeah. I mean, you can, it's the, the number of times that I've heard the word, you know, ad agency in regards to events yeah. in the last two years versus the previous, you know, 18 yeah. Yeah. is insane. Um, and so I think you're right. I think it's absolutely starting to move in that direction where it's becoming much more of an ad company driven thing for these large activations yeah. and that's going to start trickling down sure well as soon as ad companies realize the revenue available they start seeing the bills year over yeah. year from a company like mine they're going to go first of all the company like mine isn't charging near enough simply because i can't not because i don't want to the market just won't bear it but then they're going to look at it and go we could charge double for this keep it internal and with the rest of the money like that we're making now and all the new revenue, we could buy out two or three small event companies and take on their clients too, right? right. Because you don't have to now be, if I, you know, if, I, if I went to an ad agency, for example, I would take my roster of clients with me, of course, and we'd have a live experience or you know, a live event portion of that agency. And I'd also be procuring business, maybe not from an agency of record perspective, but I'd still try to continue to bring in live experiences into the firm, but that ad agency now could bring all of their clients and bill, bill the hourlies too, and everyone will make way more money. Yeah, I, I don't think they'd be able to afford your golden parachute though, so I think that's probably not gonna. Listen, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna put the magic smile out there and see what happens. So I'm still blowing up already with people trying to make me offers. The chat room is blowing up with people wanting to buy your company. Uh, listen, um, I, I, listen, and, and I would, uh, you know, and I'm not saying this here, I'm saying in general, I, I see that being the way it's going. I've talked to some people and, you know, absolutely. I, I as, a, as a leader in the industry, you know, I would, I'd like to think that if that opportunity arose, I would jump on it. It's got to be a good so, one, but. So we're starting to wind down. So I, I want to make sure that we get some of the last uh, things in here. And, and so if there are any. Uh, good event planner rants that we haven't covered that you've heard lately, uh, you know, where you've really heard someone go off about something and um, uh, what was it and would you have potentially done something different? You know, the, the biggest rants right now that I'm hearing about are all around RFPs, right? Um, I can't stand it. People seem to feel obligated by the idea that an RFP came out. Um, just, uh, you know, in general, I think there's a lot of crying in our industry. There's a lot of whining. There's a lot of complaining. Um, you know, th that's one of them, the RFPs. The other thing is, and I know, Will, you're going to sh shriek right now when I say this, but the political landscape in the United States is another thing that I'm tired of hearing about. Um, you know, I travel to the U.S. regularly. I'm a Canadian, proudly. Um, and I think that, you know, people need to just calm down first of all if you're an event professional stop posting about politics stop it like you're not endearing to anyone i get it that people have opinions and i get it that there's all sorts of sides that people are taking but honestly be a business professional you never see businesses post about you know this, this person said this or this happened here or you know you see the, the, you know, unfortunate, the terrible, unfortunate rallies going on and stuff like that. Um, I, you know, I, I, my background is Jewish. So, uh, you know, I watch this stuff and, and it makes me nervous. But you don't see businesses posting about it and reposting the clips and the, the this and that. You don't give credence to it. And as an industry, we love to give credence to whatever is 
going on today. Um, and so, you know, that's something that I say, keep politics away from your Facebook feeds and your Twitter feeds. You want to be a real business and you want to be looked at as a leader in the industry. Talk about, you know, ways that you can inspire our industry to be better, to overcome these issues. Don't whine and complain about travel bans. That they're there. What are you, are you going to do something about it? Are the associations going to do something about it? Is leadership in the industry going to do something about it? Are we all going to post about it and talk about it and how shitty it is and whatever else? Because it's shitty, right? And then move on to the RFP argument two weeks later and then move on to, you know, there was a rally in my city and it caused two events to close down and then everyone wants to talk about that. Like, I, I just, for me, the, the, the political landscape worldwide is what it is. You don't have to like it. You don't have to respect it. You can certainly talk about it in a professional manner, but leave it alone. Just like, you know, if you're going to, if you want to do something, affect change. And our industry needs to learn that, right? I, I didn't know that when I was young in the industry. I do know now. It's why I'm, you know, part of the Search Foundation. I know it'll give me a minute on that, but um, I think for me, that's, that's the biggest thing. Those are the two kind of things, you know, we jump from argument to argument, and what's the hot topic, but honestly, um, as a Canadian and as an outside person, and I know I'm not in it every day, but I go to the U.S., and guess what's going on in the U.S.? When I go to the U.S. to work, or I go to speak, you know what I notice about? Nothing. I notice nothing. I notice nothing different. It doesn't mean that your day-to-day -day may not have, you know, something may have changed, but I notice nothing different. People are still you know, out at, you know, 7 a.m. going to work and people are going home at 5 or 6 p.m. and people are working hard and making money and doing great work and our the event industry is flourishing for the most part. We're all doing, you know, well and there's no, you know, terrible sad stories, you know, in the event industry that the, you know, the current regime is causing the event industry to crumble. That would be something to talk about. Um, so I just think, you know, we are of our job is to inspire people and to engage people and, you know, to affect emotion. Let's just go be positive. Let's go be positive and do great events and do great work and great fundraisers and, you know, great association events and, and do really great things. And so that's kind of the shit that I'm really tired about right now. Mic drop. I love it. Uh, I think that, <laughs> I think that, that, I think that can be said about like everything we've just talked about too, right? Is sure. like, Stop saying shit and let's go on forward and make change and make the industry better. Uh, so I think that's a great. So with that uh, that ending, we're gonna start to wrap up the show because we are, uh, have only a little bit of time left, and uh, I wanted to make sure that we fit all the great questions in. But um, the, the we're gonna end with uh, uh, you know you've been on the show four times, so I think you've put in a new tip every single time we've done it. But what would be your one tip you'd give event planners uh, for the playing their events in the next year, whether it's related to shit not to say or whatever it may be? What would be your one tip? Yeah, you know I I think I think right now it's just so super important to um, to value collaboration. Um, I think we've kind of talked about it in all of kind of the questions and everything, whether it's why are people afraid to talk or people, you know, afraid about RFPs. When I look at a huge RFP, for example, sometimes I'll say, hey, you know what? Time to collaborate and I'll call three people that I know and let's put in a joint bid. There's almost always the option to say, this is a joint bid and here's everyone that's involved. Let's do it that way. Maybe it's to win an ILEA spree for best ILEA you know, group event or whatever else. So I think right now what the key is is collaboration because I think we can all learn from the way we charge, the way we do things. Um, you know, our businesses can all grow together. Um, and I think, you know, that's, that's, that's the trend that I want to see. I want to see more collabor collaboration, more transparency, right? So as a planner, producer, manager, whatever, you're able to say, I, here, this is my partners. This is my, my lighting partner from here. You know, my partner from here. This I do internally, so you know we don't have a partner for that, but I'm bringing in this person, this person, because clients deserve specialists. Um, and we, we too often forget that people are really good at what they do, and people like that. When I hire a general contractor, that person hires a plumber and a woodworker and whatever else. Um, and so I know we want to get to a couple of questions, but that's my, that's my thing right now. And then, I mean, that's a great... Uh you know, out, way of looking at things. It's a great way of, of, of again, trying to push things forward and, uh, you know, keeping our industry moving forward. Uh, 
I, I'm not going to go any further down that road. <laughs> I was, yeah, was going to go down right. a whole different rat hole, and there's only four minutes left. So uh, we're just going to we got to save something for for shit event planner save volume three. Um, so I think it's probably time to unfortunately move things on to kind of our last couple of things. Um, yeah. We always like to know if you have any new cool resources that you want to share, whether it's the websites or blogs or books. Yeah. You know yeah. what's 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 rattling around your head these days. Yeah, man. So listen, there's there's only one today. Um, and uh, you know, I want to I want to give a huge uh, shout out and um, a huge hang in there to the people in Houston and surrounding areas, Texas, Louisiana. Um, you know, I've I've spoken with a number of event professionals there over the last forty eight hours. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm the chairman of the Search Foundation. Uh, Search is um, an organization that gives money to event professionals in crisis. Um, and uh, you know, there there's always stuff that I'm working on and, and new cool events, new cool ideas, and whatever else. But to me right now, there's nothing more prudent than to just, you know, tell the people in Houston and the areas to, you know, hang in and, and you know, be strong. And, um, you know, uh, I, I would I would ask everybody and hopefully will and, and Brent, you don't mind later on uh, posting searchfoundation.org. Um, we have two things right now, all the money that's being donated. And I know Ilea Austin is doing a big event on uh, Tuesday and all the Ilea chapters are, are kind of putting our name out. Biz Bash is going to run a great thing for us, as is Special Event Magazine, and we've talked to a number of the blogs. So it'll be all over the place over the next week to donate to searchfoundation.org. That money will be earmarked for um, hurricane relief. As well, we have our Search 100 program, which basically is 100 people doing $100 a month, and that allows us in perpetuity, and that allows us to continue to fund all of the big programs that we need, and when a major emergency and crisis like this happens, we have the money in, in, in the bank to be able to do that stuff and help people. So, um, you know, right now that's on my mind, and, and we've spent, uh, myself and the board at Search, and, um, you know, everyone who's helping us out, we've spent the last 48 hours tirelessly trying to, you know, pull our shit together and, you know, we're all volunteers like everyone else, but um, there's nothing more worthy to talk about right now. So uh, hang in there, people in Houston and, and uh, you know, Brand Will, uh, thank you for allowing me to, to kind of do this. I, I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we definitely, for everyone who's listening, watching live or recording, Check the resources on the blog. Uh, we'll be posting it. Head to those links. Um, we definitely want you to donate, help out. I mean, uh, I've heard so many amazing stories about Search Foundation. The, don't, if you don't know about it, um, we have talked about it a couple times on the show, but it is absolutely outstanding. If you don't know about it, please check into it. They do some really, really good stuff. I know people personally who have been brought together and helped out by it, um, and those people literally say, like, I have them to thank for everything. Um, so if you're looking for uh, a good cause that's going to go directly to people uh, in need, and people like you, uh, definitely, definitely go help out the First Search Foundation. They're doing amazing things. So thank and you. And I'll tell you, it's, a, it's a registered charity, so tax receipts are always available as well. Um, you know, for everyone who who needs to know, we give the money away. So that it's not it's not a loan. There is no payback. We give the money away, and it only goes to event and live experience people. So, um, you know, when you're giving money to Search Foundation, you're helping your own, your own people, your own family, and who knows, you might be helping yourself one day. So, um, you know, we help all, all, all kinds of things, whether it's medical crisis or anything else. So, um, thank you guys for for supporting that, and thank you everybody for for any help you can do us. Absolutely, I mean, I can't agree more. We need to keep, you know, keep. Uh, affected folks uh, in, in our thoughts. It's, it's easy sometimes, I think, to just say, okay, oh, natural disaster, let it now move on. Okay. You know, uh, it really is. This thing is really, really bad. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. even the, the, the photos really don't do it justice. The, the pictures don't do it justice. There's a lot of people that are affected by this thing. And uh, I actually saw a news report from like 1935 that was like the next worst one. And that was about a quarter of the rain that they got on, yeah, on this one. Terrible. I mean, just insane. Um, so yeah, please do keep folks uh, in your hearts. And if you can help, if you can donate, if you can donate time, if you can donate money, uh, please, please do so. And we'll uh, obviously, uh, you know, keep an eye on things as we move forward. We will definitely put things in the resources file. Um, uh, with that, I mean, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, it's sorry to end on a bit of a down moment, but obviously it's, it's a hard time for a lot of folks down there. But we did have a good time today, um, and I uh, really appreciate you coming back on, Aaron, and, and yeah. going into, into um, Volume 2 
Uh, I definitely feel like there's going to have to be a volume three at some point so that we can dive even deeper into the shit um, and and see what we can do swimming around in there. Uh, uh, always so really appre- yeah, really appreciate always the honesty that I think I, I think you hit the nail on the head right there that how important it is for us to be honest and transparent about these things in our industry uh, if we if we do plan on moving forward. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, where can folks find out more about you and Fifth Element Group? And obviously, we'll have uh, the, the Search Foundation uh, in, yeah. in the in the things as well. But more about you and 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 your and Fifth Element. Sure. Yeah. So I mean, you can definitely find us on Facebook. Uh, you can find myself, or you can find Fifth Element Group uh, via Instagram. Again, uh, Aaron Kaufman, CSEP. Uh, Fifth Element Group is GRP at the end. I think we ran out of options for longer names. Um, so those those are a couple really good places. Uh, as well, I'm always available to answer industry questions, help via email, Aaron at fifth, F-I-F-T-H, elementgroup.com. Uh, I give you my phone number, but I'm pretty sure Alex Plaxon would use it a lot, and that makes me nervous. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, on that note, listen, I, I have to tell you before we sign off that uh, I have had a fucking great time here. I always love hanging out with you guys, and, you know, Brent, maybe we'll do it again at IMAX, and, Will, I'm putting volume three right now into my calendar. Um, And thank you guys for what you do because you're bringing a great message to the industry and it's really important. So um, you guys are both awesome. And uh, Laura Lopez, if you're listening, I'm still waiting for you to show up on this show in a gold onesie because you promised you would. So uh, that said, (laughs) thanks guys for doing what you do. And uh, it's awesome. It's awesome to do this with you. (laughs) All right. Nice. Thanks, man. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron, and uh, we will get you guys all next week, 5 p.m. Eastern. You know what to do. Let's sign on out of here. Thank you for joining us for another amazing episode of Hashtag Event Icons. To catch the transcription and all of the resources mentioned, head to www.helloendless.com slash blog. This week's episode will be posted and available by next Tuesday. Also, let us know what you thought about this week's episode. Share your biggest takeaway and join the Twitter conversation sponsored by Alex Plaxon and Little Bird Told Media. Just tag your post with hashtag event icons. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern right here on hashtag event icons.